Dennis Franz has fashioned a great career for himself playing cops on television. He's played almost 30 hard-bitten lawmen on TV shows like Hill Street Blues and movies like Dress to Kill. His 28th cop role, that of Andy Sipowitz on the legendary ABC drama NYPD Blue, has earned him both the Emmy and the Golden Globe. I'm really happy to see you here at CBS. We had good times at CNBC, and thanks for coming over. Thanks We've had your friend be. David Milch here a couple, two, three times. Not only my friend, my mentor, my, my hero, um, I want to be David when I grow up. Okay, and, and we've talked about the fact that much of you, of Sipowitz, comes mm -hmm. from his father. I'm just wondering how much of your father, Franz, mm -hmm. is in you. Your dad, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, ba dad, the baker in Chicago. The, the, the baker with the, uh, the allergy to flour. Not a good thing to have if you're a baker. Bad move. Um, actually, uh, the older I get, the similarities become more and more apparent. You know, things that I never thought that I would see. Just little gestures, things that you do. And when, you, when I say something to our girls, we have two daughters, and uh, uh, I find myself just making noises like my father used to make. Just these, oh, duh. And, and those guys, odd little sounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and I, the mentality that my father had to, which is a good thing, because I really truly loved and respected my father. Um, and it's taken me all these years to realize, you know, we get too soon old and too late smart. Yeah, when you say mentality, what are you talking about, Dennis? Your father's mentality. It was a very, um, uh, it was a very honest, working class, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you type of mentality. A very respectful mentality of other people. Um, not selfish in the slightest. Um, out there for a responsibility to his family, to us, and um, that's what that's what he guided his life. Much around. has been written about Andy Sipowitz yeah. and about you and about how you're the tough cop and how when 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 the times get tough, you get tough. You speak tough. You talk tough. You yeah. you walk the walk. And yet there's the side of Sipowitz that is kind. That uh, when Sipowitz, for example, is consoling the parents of a young girl who's died and they claim to see her living in a bird sitting on a windowsill, Sipowitz will say, I can see the light there. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's also written that Dennis Franz is the same guy, that you can be a tough guy. You fought for this country in Vietnam, but there's a, there, there's a great kindness within you. And, and I've, I've noticed that in some things I've read about you in, in your dealings with other people. Is there a similarity between Sipowitz and Dennis? Yeah. Thank you for, for saying that. I'd like to say that I'd, I'd like to be the kind of person sometimes that, that Sipowitz is. Um, in some respects, and obviously in others, there's something that I'm grateful that I'm not like him. Uh, but there, there are some choices when, when I do see his, his, uh, his ability to express himself completely to someone and leave a situation knowing that he has said and done everything that's in his mind to let this other people know how he stands. I, like so many of us, leave a situation, and my best argument is in the car on the way home. It's like, man, I wish I'd yeah, said that. Yeah. Man, I wish I'd have done that. Yeah. I should have smacked that guy. <laughs> and you know, and and I just, I don't do that. But uh, <clears throat> I think there is, uh, there's a consciousness about um, about Andy that I truly respect and I can relate to, and and. Uh, uh, I, I would strive to be that, that side of, uh, of Sipowitz in my life. Yeah. You have been quoted as saying that you wouldn't have traded Vietnam for anything. Right. Uh, although it was a tough part of your life. In 1968, was it? You enlisted in the Army. Yes. And you went to officer's uh, candidate school. Yes. The end of that, sir, is I would, I would um, not trade it for anything that I have done in my life, <clears throat> but I would avoid it going through it again at all costs. Okay, okay. Um, uh, having gone through it, having lived through it, having it changed my uh, outlook on life, having gone a young man, uh, a boy, if you will, coming back a young man, um, it altered my life. It uh, um, it made me take things a lot more seriously. Uh, I was very frivolous and irresponsible up until the point that I went there, and uh, it uh, it made me look at life uh, a lot more seriously than before I left. Um, I kind of took the the easy way out. I was forced into a situation when you uh, when you receive a notice from Uncle Sam saying, "Come join us." Greetings. Yeah, you've been selected you by know, a board of your friends and neighbors. <clears throat> Not too many alternatives, and uh, I didn't have the moral strength to say, 
I'm going to be a conscientious objector, or I'm going to leave the country, or I'm going to do any of any of those other turns. I I had a, a curiosity about the military. I had a fear of Vietnam, as I think most any anybody does, um, but. Um, I nevertheless um, didn't want to turn my back on it, but it was, it was something I wasn't looking forward to doing. Well, but I did want to experience the military life. I, I wanted to go through that. You, you joined up the Officers Candidate School, yeah. OCS, and after yeah. a time, for whatever the reason, it dawns on you that you, you're not cut out to be a leader of men. Yeah. You don't feel qualified to lead men. And you're transferred to the infantry and almost immediately dispatched to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. But you're in San Francisco and you're having second thoughts. You're, you're, thinking, about, you're thinking about ditching. You're thinking about going I was wall. a few days late for the plane yeah. uh, to take me over, <laughs> over to, to Vietnam. Actually, my college roommate was also um, uh, in the service in the Army, and he, and he was stationed at the hospital in uh, the Presidio, I think. The Presidio I hospital? believe so. Yeah, in San Francisco. And this guy had the life around. This is in the 60s, late 60s. And this, and, uh, this guy, Ray, he was living off base he had grown his hair long, which meant a lot in those days yes, to have did. long hair. He was living off base. He had his hair long. He had a short-haired wig that he put on. He lived with a commune. He lived in a commune in San Francisco during the heyday, around the hate ashbury area. And he was, he was in the service. And he had a bunk, and he had a thing at the hospital. All he had to do was go in and make his bunk, and he do his 9 to 5, put his wig on, put his military hat on, and then go back to his... Uh, uh, his apartment, his commune, and he was leading, leading a life of a hippie and a soldier at the same this time. This is the way to serve your country. That was it. I said, <laughs> you've got it figured out. Right. I said, you know the answers. So. But for a time, did you think about going, uh, going over the wall and staying with him and just making, uh, just not going? Oh, uh, you know, n n nothing seriously. I don't think no. it was a serious um, uh, thought in my head. I don't, I don't think I would have been able to uh, live with myself had I had done something like that. It was just a, a temporary temptation that I knew what was in store for me for the following year, and, and uh, I certainly wasn't looking forward to that, and I was envi envious of the position that he was in, and uh, I uh, wanted to stay a little longer than I was supposed to stay, you know, and uh, uh, all was forgiven when I finally got on the plane and got over there, you know, they could care less. So you were a little late, huh? I was a little late. You describe one of the experiences in Vietnam in an article in Playboy magazine last year where you're searching for the <coughs> BC, the Viet Cong. Mm -hmm. And you're under fire. Bullets are whizzing over your head, and, mm -hmm. and you describe yourself as shaking. Huh? Yeah, that happened uh, on more than one occasion, but uh, that was the one that I, I, I remember more vividly than others. Um, uh, I didn't know you don't know where uh, the fire is coming from. All you do is you can you can literally feel the bullets. Uh, you're down as low as you can on the ground, and you just are. are almost eating the dirt. You got your head buried so far in and you got the rifle up and you're shooting in the direction of where they're coming from. So you're not really trying to kill somebody? You, you don't. You just want to be out of the situation yeah, yeah. and involuntarily your body just starts doing things that you don't have a control over just out of fear and, and nerves and uh, uh, you know you just wish you could be any other place in the world except where you are at that moment and the only way to get out of it is to shoot back and make somebody stop mm -hmm. and let me get out of it. And when you came home, it, did you have a tough time coming back? You know, a lot of veterans have told me that they would, got, they, they would get on the plane at Tonsonut in the afternoon, and with the time zones, they're back on the streets of San Francisco or mm -hmm. Chicago uh, mm -hmm. the next morning or that very evening. I mean, the, 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 the time warp was so fast that it was tough for them to, to get up to speed. And there was the feeling in this country that you guys who went over there and fought were morons for going over there and doing right. it. You didn't get a lot of respect for it. Right. That was a very uncomfortable return. Um, I, I, uh, that was the happiest day of my life, I think, when I, when I came out. I literally did one of the uh, bend over and, and kiss, kiss the, the ground. Kiss the ground. Uh, I, I remember my, my foot setting on the, uh, the runway of, of American soil, and, uh, and I made a, a very mental note of when I stepped that last step off of the, the plane onto the ground, and I thought, I'm, I'm home. And I'm and safe, then, and, I'm, and safe. I'm safe, and I got through it, and uh, now, now um, uh, I have some responsibilities here. And you have the best of intentions to, to remain friends with uh, uh, the, the people who were your most important figures in your life during that year while you were over there. They're your friends, your lovers, your, you know, uh, your, your family, they're everything to you for a very temporary period of time. 
and you think it's going to be a long-lasting thing. Oddly enough, when you come back, your mind has a way of just... Uh, it's an amazing uh, yeah, just You forget that. I ran into one guy when I, came, when I first moved to Los Angeles in a 7-Eleven uh, store, and if you would have described this person to a T, uh, I don't think I'd ever been able to remember his name, but I was waiting in, uh, uh, in line with my box of detergent to pay for it to go do the, the laundry next door, and uh, I, I saw somebody in an aisle, and I did a, a double take at him, and he did the same thing to me, and he said, Denny? I said, Neil? And it was just like that, it was immediate. But if you would have described him before, I never would have. And we talked for about an hour. Yeah. We relived what happened after he left, after I left, we left at different times. We parted ways, I went with a different unit, and he went with a different unit midway through our tour. And uh, it turns out that he was living about 10 blocks from me. We exchanged phone numbers. I liked this guy. He liked me. We were friends over there. We thought a lot of each other. We did not get in touch with each other. Ten blocks away, I have yet to ever hear from him nor call him. And this was a friend. It's something in there that I just, you know, he and I both put out. Would you ever want to go back? A lot of guys have gone back, you know? Mm-hmm. I would certainly have a curiosity it's for the your country. Yeah, it's know. a... Uh, I don't know if I, I don't know if I need any kind of closure of that experience, but uh, I would like to see the country in peacetime. That's, that is, a, it's a beautiful country. It's a gorgeous it's an country. enchanting country, and I'd love to go back and experience that for that sake. Mm -hmm. We're with Dennis Franz from NYPD Blue. The toll free is up and running. We'll get to the organic theater in Chicago Ooh. and the beginning of a great career in film and television after these messages. We're with Dennis Franz. We've been talking here in the break about Nick Turturro, who was here the other night, who told us about his singing and how his family's so sick of him singing My Way, and your trailer is next to his. My trailer is right across from his trailer. We should, we, uh, uh, we're we in, in a stone's throw from each other, and I hear I hear his conversation. I hear him singing all the time. The guy loves to sing, and I'm usually hearing My Way, yeah. but there's one I'm hearing, Oh, say, can you see <laughs> by the dark? And I open up my trailer, and as, as he's singing, the stars being went loud. So I'm standing there at attention, holding my heart. I get everybody else gathered around my trailer, and I start standing at attention. And he finishes, uh, uh, and he finishes the last round, and I said, "Play ball!" And we start, and he opens the door, and he's, "Ah, you guys, you guys." <laughs> <laughs> I think he was going to sing at a ball game somewhere. He, he was. He was yeah. going to sing at the opening, uh, the, the, the opening of some oh, some team. I forget. <laughs> the guy loves to sing. Yes, yeah. he does. Did he sing on your show? Yes, he did. There you I go. Think he, I think he did the national anthem because <laughs> we're, right. we too are sick of his my way. <laughs> my way. <laughs> he sang my way at my wedding. Oh God. Yes, he did. <laughs> I was going to save that to later, but let me ask you about mm -hmm. that. On your 50th birthday, yes. you, your dear friend Joe Montaigne, who's been here before, who's yes. a wonderful actor and a paisano, mm -hmm. and all of your friends are, are at, a, at, a, at a place, and you have your mm -hmm. 50th birthday, and, yeah. and you're, you, it's all pictures of you, and you go on from there. Wonderful yeah. night. Um, my, my wife, um, uh, at the time, who was not my wife, we had been together for um, nearly 13 years. Uh, 12 and a half years at the time, and it was my 50th birthday. She's she a very patient throw me. woman, isn't she? Yes, she is. God love her. Julie. We got married, Joni. Joni. We got married on the 13th anniversary of the day we met, which happened to be April Fool's Day. Um, <laughs> and uh, she threw me a 50th birthday party. She, was, she wanted it to be a surprise, but on the 40th birthday, she threw me a surprise party, and we almost split up that night. I hated it. I made her promise Never again. not to throw me a surprise party. She swore she was not going to. Um, uh, the evening, the house filled up with uh, 200 people, and uh, we never spoke to each other throughout the night. We almost split up. So on the 50th, she was not going to. Well, she, well, why, she, why wouldn't you like this? I just didn't. I felt very uncomfortable and awkward in, in that position. I, uh, I don't so much like to be the center of attention. I feel I, I share that, but you know, a friend of mine did that for me when I was 60 a, couple, a month ago. Yeah. And I got there and I was pissed for about a minute, and then all of a sudden I said, hey, wait a second. These yeah. are, you know, these are my They're family. doing it for love. Yeah, you yeah, know, exactly. they're doing it for, and I knew that. I knew they were, but she, I felt a betrayal on her yeah. part. Yeah. And I felt so anyway, this time you so knew. This time she said, okay, if I throw you a party, uh, can I throw you one as long as you tell me about it? Yes. Okay. So um, what she didn't tell me is that she flew all my relatives in. Yeah. Um, that was the surprise. I came home from work the night before the party, 
and uh, walked in the door and turned the corner and I did a double take and my entire family was was there all my relatives had been uh, flown in and they were and my first thought was where are you gonna sleep <laughs> we don't have enough bedrooms um, and, the, the, and who the are the relatives like uh, my aunts uncles my uh, uh, my sisters my, uh, okay. um, my uh, nieces and nephews and, and uh, uh, dear friends of ours who live in different okay. parts of the country um, then we had a party the following night. It was about 225 people at a beautiful restaurant. She had pictures of my, my youth when I was a young boy, and I had hair, and I was relatively thin. Um, <laughs> and it was just really a, a great, great evening. And then Montana. Everything in our, and Joey gets, gets up, and he made uh, a beautiful speech about what Joni and I meant to him. And, uh, and he said to you if, that if you were my brother, I could not love yeah. you more. Yes, he said. It's got to be a very emotional moment, huh? Yeah. yeah. It was an emotional evening in general. And uh, I, I was just so wrapped up with, uh, with feelings. And I thought, if I don't do this tonight, I will re regret it for the rest of my life. And so, so you I, have a little surprise. I huh? went up to thank everybody for being there. And I said, Joni, would you? I just sort of stopped and said, would you come up here a minute? I said, I, I really don't have this planned, and I, and I don't have anything in my pocket to offer you, um, but if I, if I don't do this now, um, I'll regret it, and uh, this is a perfect time. Would you marry me? Oh, and geez. everything oh, broke geez. up, and it was just pretty wonderful. Yeah, that and is so neat. So uh, the surprise. I hope she said yes. The yeah. surprise. Yeah. Turned into, <laughs> and we just celebrated our... Finally, we got a, a belated honeymoon. We spent uh, three weeks in a beautiful little village in, in uh, the south of Italy. Oh, man. I, I could get started on that. But I, I know you I, could. I, but I do that with everybody who comes here, and these folks are sick of it, so I won't do it tonight. <laughs> but I'm a little choked here with you saying, hey, Julia. You know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, to Gord, who's on the TV, or on the TV, he's on the telephone, and <laughs> confused. Ottawa, Ontario, hello. Hi, and now I am on the TV. Yeah, yes, you are. <laughs> and the it's, radio, too. It's an honor to talk to two men responsible for so much quality television. Oh, you're very kind. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my question for Dennis Franz is, uh, your character is so rich and three-dimensional. Um, I wonder if sometimes some of the things you have to do as Sipowitz uh, makes you cringe and you think people are going to think I'm really like this. No, um, you know, I will have to say that, that uh, as an actor... <clears throat> You really look forward to opportunities when you can uh, dig into some uh, secret parts of you that maybe you're not aware of or you haven't explored or, or you have touched upon and you like to go back to. Uh, and you know, you're, I know I'm, I'm representing Andy Sipowitz when I'm doing it. I know I'm not representing Dennis. Uh, I can separate the two. Um, and for the thing, the person I have to thank for giving me that opportunity to explore those areas is the, the gentleman we were talking about earlier, David Milch. David is the heart and soul of uh, not only the show, but of particularly Andy Sipowitz. And does, Sipowitz does Andy Sipowitz make you a better man? Um, Just yes. Just because you learn so much from him? I, I'm not going to... No, yes, I, I, I will I, say yes. I'd say that Dennis Franz... Uh, oven by himself is a very good man. Oh, I know, and I think I'm a good man too, but I, I feel like I learn things from Andy Sipowitz. Learn, yes. Thank you. That's, that's, uh, that's good to know. Thank you. And, and yes, I share your thought. I, I learned from Andy, yes. One, one quick trivia question. Mm. Sure. Uh, since Jimmy Smith joined the show, I wondered about this. Your characters' names are Andy and Bobby. There was Andy and Bobby Ranko and Hill on Hill Street Blues. Is there a connection there? It's the Andy and Bobby hour. It's the Andy and Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> Not to my knowledge, I, I don't know. Unless Gord's uncovered some new truth <laughs> here right. that we don't know anything about. Or ask, Mr. Ask, ask Mr. Botchko about that, and you can tell Tom next time you're on the show. All right, I'll do All that. Right, Thanks, fine. Gord. Thanks, and Gord. Tom, Tom, you're a rich, you're a rich three-dimensional character too. You're very kind, sir. Thank you're you. The best. Have, have a good you. evening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. L listen uh, quickly. Uh, or, or is the break mm -hmm. ready? We should. Okay, let me, and then I want to ask you, you did a show, I don't know, did you do Cops with Montaigne? Yes, in I Chicago? did. And I want to ask you where, you where you did the research, where you drove around in the car. Oh, okay, great. Okay. Good. Dennis Franz is the guest. NYPD Blue needs uh, no plug from me. Back with Dennis and you on the toll-free after a break.
Uh, Larry in St. Johnsbury, Vermont. Hello. Hello, Tom. Welcome to the show, my friend. I'm just pleased that you're calling from the uh, birthplace of my father, which was the state of Vermont. Oh, no kidding. What part? Uh, Rutland, Vermont, sir. Oh, he's just down the, down the road a piece. Listen, all of the world is down a piece of the road from... What did I just say? Down the road a piece from Bobby Rutland. and Andy. <laughs> Bobby and Andy. Bobby and Andy. <laughs> anyway, go ahead, Larry. Say hi to Dennis. He's hi, right Dennis. How are you? Great, Larry. How you doing? That I'm doing real good, thanks. Uh, earlier, Tom mentioned the different sides of Sipwitz, you know, how he's always tough and there's also a soft side to him. But the biggest part that impresses me and was not mentioned is... His butt. The <laughs> part of... Uh, <laughs> Yeah. It's it's actually it's actually the part of Sipwitz being a recovering alcoholic. Yeah. Okay, and as a person in recovery myself, there's been other shows on that have depicted people in recovery but never really got to the heart of it like you do. You know, going through the stress of your everyday job and the rigors of the police work and fighting off the addiction. And, right. you know, when your son, uh, tragedy, your son getting killed and showing that there are things that can make people fall off the wagon. You know, I really want to thank you on behalf of myself and a lot of other people in recovery for the inspiration that you've given and for actually showing what it is really like. Thank you. I appreciate that a lot, Larry. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, it's a one day at a time It thing. is a one day at a time, that's right. And that's, and that's what we try to emphasize in, in uh, uh, struggles with Andy, is that it is um, uh, very difficult. It's a very easy thing sometimes to, um, to trip and, and, and go off, but uh, uh, for dramatic purposes sometimes also we have to alter it a little bit. Uh, but we, we have to uh, uh, always keep in the forefront of our minds uh, the difficulty that he has dealing with the day-to-day -day struggles of getting through life. Well, you've shown that the biggest part of it is that there's really no shame in falling off the wagon. The shame is not getting back on. You know, you've picked yourself back up. Right. And that's, that's the reality of this disease, you know. Well, thank you. It can happen to anybody, and I want to thank you for that very I much. Appreciate great that. great words, lot. Larry. Great words. One day at a time, my friend, and thanks for calling us tonight. Well, thank you. Good night, sir. Good luck. Good night. Thanks. Uh, the, the cops. You're in this show with Joe Montana, yeah. and you want to do a little research on what it's like to be a cop. This is before you've played all these roles, right? Right. Yeah. This was, the f uh, in fact, the first cop role I did was a show called Cops, and uh, this was in Chicago, and we were learning... We were hanging out with some of Chicago's finest, and they were taking us to uh, places where they hung out so we could get a, a taste of what it was, yeah. what, what they're like. Um, we thought we had a pretty good sense of it, so we thought we'd try it on our own. And uh, my, my father had an old Chevy that didn't look too much like an unmarked car, uh, an unmarked police car. It could pass for one oh, of it, those. Oh, it, it, it did look a little bit like one. It did. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It did look like an unmarked police car. My little disease is catching, you see. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, you got that disease, Oh, too? do I ever. Oh, man. <laughs> well, I have no idea what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sober as a judge, and I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so you have your dad's it's done car, you yeah. well, yes. Um, so uh, we went out with my father's car, and we would drive through the streets and just see what the response was of people looking at us in the car and, and just trying to get an attitude of uh, having some sense of authority. Yeah. Uh, we saw a group of guys on a corner once and they looked like they were up to no good and enjoying it. I looked at each other and said, should we try? Yeah, let's see, you know, let's see if, if it's working at all. So we pulled over the side and they looked at us and we got out of a car and started walking over towards them. We didn't have to say a word. They dispersed. Split, yeah. And they started going in different directions, you know. And I said, you know, I think we can do the play now. Yeah. Think, oh, we're on the right track. And wasn't there a time where you saw some ladies of the evening standing around? Uh, more than once. Yeah. Yeah, and they also dispersed. <laughs> I have to ask you mm -hmm. about the piano that you and your bride bought for 35 bucks. Oh, back, gosh. Uh, that you trucked all the way out here from wherever you bought it. You, you collect, I, I read about you, you collect chingers, I call them. Chingers. Chotskis. Yes, yes, that's, that's right. And... Uh, uh, this was in, in uh, Lake of the Ozarks, Missouri, and uh, we had gone to this this huge auction where um, uh, an old um, uh, 
Quaker family was selling off all of their belongings. And we had bought like 33 pieces of furniture. Mm -hmm. My wife was putting them all together and getting them together. And uh, I said, enough is enough. We don't need anything else. So, so I, I saw this, this old upright piano yeah, going, like, yeah. Yeah, going for uh, $25. And I said to John, A piano says, for 25 said, bucks? This piano is going for $25. And she, uh, so I said, uh, 30 And uh, somebody said, 32 something. 32 I 50 said, Yeah, I said, 35 Thirty-five dollars. I got the piano. I said, I got a piano for thirty-five dollars. Right? Went over, tried to pick up the piano. This thing weighs a literally a ton. <laughs> I said, How are we going to get this back? Truck. We decided to 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 spend Christmas in Chicago with my relatives one year, and we had planned a cross-country trip. We we're going to pick up on the way back, pick up the piano in a U-Haul, drive it back to the city. Well, we drove through. Uh, the, the worst blizzard that they ever had. I, I think it was it was our worst blizzard in that area ever. And the streets were all literally frozen. Uh, and you could you could watch the trailer trucks just glide off the sides of the highway. And there we are putting along, carrying this piano in the back, trying to save a buck. You know, we didn't want to spend the money to ship it home because that would have cost money. Are you on Hill Street Blues at this time, or uh, and This was afterwards. This was after. So you had a couple of bucks. From I could have done it, but it would have not made for a story. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm down to a minute, so <laughs> okay. let's get it back we there. We got it back there. Now it's, it's, uh, we've had it on the back porch. We've never done anything with it. It is like a, a $35 planter is what we've got in the back porch. <laughs> we just bought a new home in Montecito, and uh, our first thought was, We've got a place for the piano. We have now. a place for the well, piano. We have to get it fixed up first. Wait till you get it, have it fixed up, pal. You have no. <laughs> That's right. I've done that once. Oh, it's unbelievable. Oh, really? I know you're giving an award, uh, the Victor Awards. Yes, the Victor Awards, the uh, 30th uh, annual Victor Awards at the Las Vegas Hilton on the 28th of uh, June. 28th, 29th of June, on behalf of the City of Hope, of Hope Hospital. Of Hope. That's correct. Now we don't know which award you're giving yet. No, I don't know which one, but it'll be one of uh, Wayne ones. Gretzky or uh, uh, Walter Payton. Uh, Jackie, uh, well, Jackie uh, Jenner, Kess, Kersey. Kersey, thank you. Jackie Joyner, Kersey. Jackie, Jackie Joyner, Kersey. Right. Excuse me. Oh, yes. Right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I yeah. won't be giving that one, that's for sure. <laughs> it's, it's the Andy and Bob show. <laughs> Bless you, my me. friend. Congratulations on your marriage and on your kids and everything else. And thanks, thanks for your kindness to me over the years. I, Thank it you. means more to me than I can tell you. Likewise. Back at you. Okay. Uh, next up, Nicholas Pelleggi. The guest here has been Dennis Franz. And the program, as you know and as you love, is NYPD Blue. We'll be right back.